Thank you. Welcome to the second Tuesday lecture series, which is the longest running program here at the center. I hope you're all doing well under the COVID lockdown, and I really can't wait to see you all in real life. My name is Howard Williams, and I'm the volunteer coordinator for the second Tuesday series, which is now meeting virtually through Zoom. Over the past 35 years, the second Tuesday series has presented over 400 noted authors, artists, politicians, performers, academics, religious leaders, athletes, and musicians in informal lectures, discussions, readings, probably most famously in March 1987, Larry Kramer's appearance at a second Tuesday was the official founding of ACT UP. I hope you're all members of the center. Do yourself a favor, go to www.gaycenter.org and sign up where it says sign up for our newsletter so you can be reminded about this series and then other perfect things that are going on there. This is the second Tuesday series, so we do have a couple of upcoming programs. Next month is June, Pride Month, and so on June 8th, we have my absolute favorite New York thinker working today, Sarah Shulman. She's the author of Let the Record Show, A Political History of Act Up, which is being billed as one of the most important books of the year. It's already gotten rave reviews from the New York Times and a bunch of other sources. Um, this is 20 Years in the Making, A Comprehensive Critical History of Act Up and American AIDS Activism. She will talk about this book with AIDS and political activist Stephen Thrasher. Then in July, we have John Paul Brommer. He's an online advice columnist. He was originally at Grindr. Now he's on Substack. He's our very own Dear Abby or Ann Landers or Carrie Bradshaw. His new book is called Hola Poppy, How to Come Out in a Walmart Parking Lot. Um, he'll read from the book, but he'll also be taking uh, questions and effort, offering advice, just like he does, about how to be gay, how to date, how to treat your ex-boyfriends, about food, everything important. Tonight, Julie Moretto is probably one of the most praised abstract artists, really one of the most talked about artists of any type today. And as you know, she has a giant survey going on right now at the Whitney Museum of Art. New York Times and New York Magazine and Art News have all had several fabulous stories about her. And that's a great thing, but there's a problem with all of these articles. All of them have grainy little pictures that just reproduce the art horribly. You can't tell what's going on in these giant paintings or the scale of the work, which ranges from tiny to immense, or the number and kinds of layers that go on in the works. I felt this years ago when I was in art history class and the teachers would put up slides for you to look at and then I got to see the real pictures later and thought oh that's what they were talking about and after I moved to New York I used to go to galleries and always pick up the postcards that they had at the gallery ship remember when galleries had postcards and sometimes I was always amazed at how well the art reproduced and sometimes it just reproduced horribly well I've never seen a greater discrepancy between the photographs that you see in the magazines and newspapers and what you actually see on the wall at the museum you have to see this show live to understand it and I can't under, underestimate the words multi-layered enough multi-layered in so many ways we're thrilled to be able to offer this evening with cooperation of the Whitney Museum of American Art and to get us started we're very lucky to have Jin Wang who's going to walk us through the show Jin is a Joan Tisch teaching fellow at the Whitney and a PhD candidate in contemporary art at the Institute of Fine Arts at NYU. She's curated and lectured widely in the US, Europe, and Asia, and her latest writings have appeared in Art in America, Art Agenda, and Mouse, Moose. She is currently planning an exhibition that explores Asian futurisms at the Chinese in America's Museum in New York City. After Jin walks us through a little bit of the show, um, Julie will, Mayor Ratu will be joining us for our Q&A period, so please submit your questions like Richard said. Um, I don't have to tell you that Julie Moretto has shown her work extensively in the US and abroad in solo and group exhibitions. She's also on show in the Grief and Grievance show that's at the New Museum right now, which is also very interesting. She's a recipient of many awards, including the MacArthur Award and the US Department of State Medal of Arts Award. She's a member of the American Academy of Arts and Letters and is represented by the Marion Goodman Gallery here in New York. She lives in New York and Berlin with her wife and children. Please help me first warmly welcome Jin Wang and later Julie Moretti. Thank you, Howard, for that really energetic introduction. Um, this is both an immense pleasure and privilege um, and a little bit nerve wracking for me because I've never given these public lectures with the artist um, simultaneously present. Uh, but hopefully this gives you, um, our audience, 
something to react to and work with um, when we finally open up to a direct conversation with the artist. Um, I was told that the plan would be uh, me talking for about 30 minutes, but um, Julie, since you're here, if there are some comments or um, some part where you would like to elaborate or interrupt, feel free to do so. I think I'm here to really facilitate our experience with the artist and her work. Um, and so, as I mentioned earlier, this is a, a sort of a digital walkthrough um, of the artist's mid-career survey at the Whitney Museum. And I completely resonate with what Howard mentioned earlier about how, how unsatisfactory it is to look at these works in a digital format. Um, so one of the ways I chose to perhaps spice things up a little bit is to include these gifts um, in the landing page to show you the artist's hand at work and immediately giving you a sense not only of the scale, but also the indeed layered nature of many of these images where you can see the artist smudging and creating gestural marks on um, a surface that is already loaded with abstract filled in patterns, other kind of gestural uh, marks as well as architectural rendering, which is a seminal part of many of Julie's most recognizable works. Um, and I will also be quoting the artist herself profusely because during my research I found her to be one of those um, artists who's incredibly, um, I think, articulate and, and and precise in speaking to their own practice. Um, and one of the phrases that always stuck with me was um, when Julie Meritu articulated her ambition for many of her works is that as if she's creating these tectonic visions of space and time that is also historical, which I think really demarcate all of these complex registers that you will encounter in works. Um, and I'm including an example at the very start titled Looking Back to a Bright New Future from 2003. And we already have, I think, this interest in playing with the ironies of time and, and this kind of temporal and historical dimension. Well, the, the work itself also reflected on more concrete gestures like post-independence Africa and various African nations that are evoked through these um, colored shapes that might remind you of contours and silhouettes of national borders and this kind of clusters and atlas of dots that also have cartographical significance um, speaking to perhaps important capital cities and then at the inter uh, dispersed throughout the image we have um, these tracings of architectural renderings and public spaces that are then cohered with these dynamic architectonic lines um, radiating from the center and really giving the work a sort of compositional torque. Um, and given the unsatisfactory format of looking at um, Julie's work on the screen, I also want to just really highlight how immersive and, and, and immense many of these works are. So here we're looking at Julie Meritu at work on one of her special commissions for the S SF MoMA. Um, and these panels were so huge that she had to rent a church in Harlem in order to complete them. Um, and another note on the creative process, which um, the artist can correct me on this, but when she was working on the commission, the jazz musician Jason Moran, who also had uh, a kind of solo show and retrospective at the Whitney shortly before the pandemic started, um, was, was in the same space and music was frequently a component um, as the artist to create these incredibly condensed and congealed um, landscapes of references, gestural marks, abstract and specific meaning. And before I go any further, I want to then familiarize ourselves with who the artist is. Um, Julie Meritu was born in 1970 in Addis Ababa, the capital city of Ethiopia, located in Eastern Africa. Um, and on the right, we included a family portrait of the artist um, with her American father and uh, American mother and Ethiopian father. And the family relocated to East Lansing, Michigan in 1978, um, around 1978, um, during the escalated um, tension and, and terror domestically after um, the Ethiopian civil war broke out. And this was um, a very early but important um, I think moment in the artist's life where that experience of being uprooted um, continues to, to influence and register um, her interest in not only American politics and um, 
kind of social um, affairs, but also um, international geopolitics in which America played an important role. And I will also briefly highlight here that um, the artist pursued um, uh, college degrees in the States um, and the academic disciplines, which was um, incredibly interesting to me, encompassed art, art history and liberation theology, which is um, an ad academic discipline that combines um, Christian theology with socioeconomic analysis um, with the hopes to liberate and support the oppressed. Um, and you can see that sort of forming a certain constellation that um, predict um, the, the active agents in the artist's work to, uh, to come in, up in the coming decades. Um, Julie Meritu also went um, to a very prestigious MFA program at the Rhode Island School of Design, often abbreviated as RISD, graduating in 1970, 1997. Um, and it was during this period that she started to really develop um, and, and conceptual, conceptualize the drawing practice, which according to the artist is foundational and primary, which I took to understand as um, not as a preparatory step towards um, painting or any kind of finished surface, but valuing the dynamic and open structures um, of uh, drawing as a medium. And in the galleries, we have an example from a very early work during the artist's risky years titled Migration Direction Map. Um, where we already, we were already, uh, I think, experiencing a kind of tension between uh, what might read as a pragmatic or a, a sort of um, uh, mundane um, clusters of signs, including these um, little uh, crosses and the directions that seem to point to a system at work. But at the same, at the same time, we have no idea uh, what these uh, larger shapes by me and how they might interact or the context for their interaction, but rather perhaps an abstract um, display and um, exploration of a chaotic system at work. Um, another early work from 1998 expanded on these so-called maps of no, no location. Um, and we again have these recognizable, perhaps cartographical references, small clusters that might remind you of settlements, of waterways, of towns, but we don't have any legend to work with the scale and to really locate these works. And at the same time, we're already, start, we're already starting to see a kind of um, a variety of um, different markings and shapes appearing from um, more I think geometric lines and shapes like these ellipses to these smaller clusters of markings, which the artist called characters. And it's particularly interesting to me that there is a sort of linguistic connection to describing these works as if this is a different kind of language system. And here I want to insert a brief kind of art historical um, context, which is Situation International's work, um, these mid-century collective art collective of artists, activists, and philosophers. Um, and here I think using a concrete example of Guy Debord's psychogeographical map of Paris, um, and really favoring a rational and um, kind of discursive exploration of urban space in this um, notion through this notion of of, of drifting through the city rather than um, going across its predestined routes of social organization. And you can see these arrows and these urban layout and kind of a radically new way of exploring and mapping them, um, finding its resonance in Julie Meritu's work as well. And then using that, I want to move onward to uh, one of the artist's earliest um, sort of fully panoramic and large scale work that's also part of a loosely um, thematically linked cycle. Um, and we frequently will encounter these um, interesting and sometimes obscure titles. This one is titled Retopistics, a renegade excavation. Um, Retopistics, topistics refers to the holistic study of a place and the human activities accumulated. And retopistics, I think, signals um, sort of an interest in revisiting and um, kind of excavating new information and new knowledge, perhaps. And we are also looking at the results of the artist directly um, incorporating architectural mapping and rendering into these um, 
already map like um, compositions composed of um, characters of, of gestural marks and of these geometric shapes and lines um, that are incredibly dynamic. And we might be able to recognize some of these architectural elements, including stairs and escalators and other key components of public spaces that we all have our own experiences with and our own, I think, connected, connected connotations. And then there are also very specific depictions of meteorological events and disasters and bombing. Um, this is also, I think, a period of um, the artist in the artist's career when she increasingly responded to ongoing geopolitical struggle um, in Studia from 2004, uh, were confronted with this fascinating and immersive um, vista um, of a stadium. Uh, we recognize that by perhaps looking at these rows of pageantry and national flags um, and just you know, responding to the overall um, architectural layout of the space, imagining ourselves sitting in one of these open stadiums. At the same time, the artist was thinking about the kind of his, historical notions of public stadiums um, and these sites as both um, vehicles for propaganda and assembly um, and all kinds of accumulated human activities and um, knowledge and stories. Um, and I mentioned earlier that there were specific um, references to contemporary events and in this case, um, it was the first, the end of the first full, full year of the Iraq war, as well as the media frenzy that was kind of being channeled towards the planning and the spectacle of the Summer Olympics in Athens in 2004. Um, another really important, I think, reference point for Julie Maritou's work is the notion of the palimpsest, which also happens to be the title of this work, which was created alongside a whole series while well, the artist was living um, and working um, at, at the time when she was working and living in Berlin and looking, reflecting back onto um, uh, public structures and buildings that um, endured their own share of history and destruction. Um, and for those of you who are not familiar with the notion of palimpsest, it essentially refers to the practice of writing, erasure and rewriting um, well, the older traces of erased writing still register as a kind of haunting uh, presence, a ghost-like um, knowledge. Um, and I remember one of the artist talks that Julie Maratou did um, where she was asked to describe her practice and she said it, it is never tabula rasa, always palimpsest. Um, and I think this is a work that really illustrates that point where you can't even distinguish the layers of identical um, architectural tracings and renderings being laid on top um, to, to the point that they register as a sort of haze um, that I think resonate with us in a more tactile way rather than a, a kind of um, layout of architectural planning. And in my public lecture series around Julie Meritu's work, I frequently linked this kind of palimpsest approach to other contemporary artists like William Kentridge, I won't go into too much detail about his practice, except to say that it's drawn out, I think even in an even more visceral way um, in this kind of animated sequence um, in moving images where you can see um, the body or the corpse slowly, um, but recognizably transforming to the land um, in the part of the narrative where the artist reflected on the double um, trauma and violence inflicted upon apartheid body and land. And on the left, just more wonderful gifts showing you Julie Maritou's hand at work, creating marks and erasing, um, just to drive home the point of the palimpsest. And building up on that, um, I, I also want to uh, showcase works like this one, Black City, um, where the artist was um, kind of painting and creating in the throes of uh, Hurricane Katrina, but also it was the period when, uh, while working and living in Berlin, um, looking back um, at the city's own tormented history, um, as well as America's involvement in many of these geopolitical struggles throughout the 20th century, um, American, this kind of perpetual um, imperialism and uh, militarism 
And I would just include one detail of um, this insignia from the US Army Air Forces that was in use during the Second World War. Um, and there are many other reference points that maybe Julie herself can speak to later on. Um, but I think whenever I speak about these, people are always fascinated by, um, or they, they felt satisfying um, in, in the sense that they can recognize um, concrete references, but at the same time being paralyzed almost by the amount of information and condensation in these um, incredibly rich um, surfaces. Um, and from there, I want to look at another series of work chronologically moving also into the 2010s. Um, we're looking at um, both one of the panels of a four panel painter uh, painted cycle called the Mogama and detail of um, that particular panel. So this was a series of works that was created um, in the throes of the Arab Spring, um, pro-democracy protests and uprising that took place in countries like Egypt, Tunisia, Libya, and Syria um, in 2011. Um, and the title Mogama refers to this government building um, located right on Tahir Square where many protesters gathered during the Arab Spring movements. Um, and Jewel Meritu was interested not only in this particular potent site, but other um, kind of in loaded um, locations that are also their own sense of public squares and places uh, where possibilities of public gathering um, um, was um, integral to the fabric of the city and its history. So, um, and here I'm borrowing a slide from the one of the curators of the show, uh, Rue Hockley, to illustrate other, I think, active references that range from the Tiananmen Square to the Occupy Wall Street movement, and detail to show you how that layered um, tactile qualities of the work um, might register when you come really, really close, where we still have these curvilinear dynamic lines, the architectural tracing, um, and parts of um, the artist perhaps brushed traces that are clearly also smudged um, in, and erased later on, and then markings that are already quite close to the written language. Just quickly checking the time. I think I'm still doing okay. Um, and there's also, I think, uh, an important element that Julie Meritu frequently evoked in interviews of a kind of self-ethnographic study, meaning locating one's um, own lives and um, own place um, in the thicket of these um, entangled forces. So in one of the Mogama works, you might also be recognized, you might also be able to recognize um, these light fixtures that were directly taken uh, from the Mexico Square in Addis Ababa, which um, went through its own kind of series of being renamed and being claimed and dominated by um, different forces. Um, another work that was inspired by the Tahir Square was Cairo. Um, and here you can see these interconnected links also incorporated the notion of bus stops of urban structures in addition to tracings of urban space. Um, but once you zoom in on these works, they also have these incredibly vivid um, and detailed kind of local depictions of specific buildings um, that are constantly connected by and intersected by broader um, gestural lines. Um, and here I decided to include a kind of a reference photograph to one of those indelible images during the coverage of the Arab Spring movement and relating again to um, one of Julia Maratou's quotes um, when she related um, the experience of going to the fireworks where you sense um, both the energy of the crowd and feel the explosion. Um, in some of these works. And I think this is an apt image to accompany that. Um, and around 2013, and this is also, I think, a turn you will be able to experience rather um, um, kind of spontaneously in the gallery space, um, the artist took um, a sort of formal turn from the previous sort of layered complex imagery or approach that incorporated a lot of architectural rendering 
um, to one that reintroduces the body and bodily um, presence um, in works that are both more intimate and more large scale. Um, so uh, the specific circumstance for these works was um, the dis the interruption and destruction brought upon by Hurricane Sandy, um, which flooded many buildings, including I think the building where the artist studio was. So she had to transport some of the prepared canvases home and only relied on her hands and limbs to drag out traces on a really unforgiving um, surface. By unforgiving, I mean um, surfaces that really respond to uh, manipulations and really document and register these. Um, kind of markings. Um, and you can see the example on the right invisible sun that I think it further expands what was already um, present in being higher um, into a more, I think, agitated and elegiac composition um, and filled with unruly markings. And the background for this work um, was, you know, a kind of reflection on the ongoing civil unrest in the Middle East um, that is radically different from perhaps a more utopic um, and optimistic overview that was documented in the Mogama, that were explored in the Mogama cycle. And a similar work um, in this moment of, I think, agitated um, elegiac melancholy is Epigraph uh, Damascus, which is the artist's largest uh, print work, making use of a 19th century photographic technique titled, uh, called Photogravier. Um, perhaps the artist can go into the technical element a bit later, but I'm including a few screenshots from a documentary that traced that very process um, where the artist worked with a master printer um, to relay and recreate and layer um, both printed images and gestural marks um, in, in an incredibly complex tactile surface. But what is rather poignant, I think, is that when you um, pierce through these thickets of um, gestural marks, you'll be able to see um, structures, buildings, um, spaces destroyed by the ongoing war in Syria. Um, rendered in a kind of upside down um, direction. Um, and I might just quickly skip this, but uh, it, this is also a sort of reference image that I saw Julie Maritou frequently bringing up when thinking about um, sort of the, the, the expansive art historical um, uh, image repertoire um, that are uh, somewhat linked and resonant to her own practice. But thinking about um, you know, Chinese landscape painting tradition that also cons with it um, a different way of navigating and negotiating space that comes with it multiple vantage point and a drastic contrast between built and architectural element with the immensity of the natural environment and, and the sort of ideological space um, and persuasion this kind of image subscribes to. And it's rather poignant when we link that to an image like Damascus. And then the final um, sort of formal turn I'll, I'll discuss today um, is when uh, the artist started to incorporate news images, but manipulating them and distorting them to form a kind of abstract color base um, for then um, other kind of gestural and spray painted um, textures on top. Um, and frequently these were images that um, responded to very specific um, uprisings and, and protests and, and riotous um, activities. For instance, this one of other planes up there, um, again, quoting um, the curator uh, Rue Hockley's reference, um, the foundational layer was um, kind of pieced together and manipulated from um, news images of protest against um, various policies by under the Trump administration, um, combined with also with images of um, detention centers for children at the border, um, which is a rather ironic way of, you know, working with photographic sources, which we tend to adhere a degree of um, claim to truth to, or we consider as sources of reality. Um, by the same time, we, we're fully aware of the man manipulatable potential of the photographic medium. Um, and, and so the, when, when they are abstracted mm -hmm. to 
an extent that we can hardly recognize the source material, I think they start to take on um, perhaps more coded meaning for the artist. Um, I heard someone making like noise coming from another screen. So let me know if I should stop here because I'm literally at the end. Um, so. No, I was just coughing. You're oh, good. okay. All right. Well, um, to quickly wrap up, um, I want to then look at uh, the work that was made specifically for the Whitney um, iteration of the exhibition titled Ghost Time After the Raft. Um, and you by now probably recognize that um, the, the colorful abstract backgrounds came from specific news image sources. And indeed, in this case, um, they came from anti-immigration demonstrations in various EU nations, um, essentially against refugees um, seeking shelter. Um, and you, I, I always see that kind of image as a reversal or anthropic version of a more, I think, hopeful image like um, looking back to a bright new future. Um, but another part of the title after the raft refers to this highly recognizable art historical image, um, the raft of the Medusa created in the early 19th century by Jericho um, with a, a narrative that felt both ironic and, and relevant um, to the protest images that formed the, foundation, the foundational layer of ghost time. Um, where we have essentially French passengers um, heading towards present day Maritania. Um, and due to a series of unfortunate uh, mis mismanagement and corruption, ended up um, in a life raft after um, the ship sank and the passengers descending into um, deeply disastrous realities, um, including cannibalism as depicted in this, I think, highly grotesque, but also moralizing image. But we don't have any of that kind of deliberate moral persuasion in a work like Ghost Time, which I think draws on the power and potency of abstract image. But it is placed in a very specific location facing the Hudson River and the Statue of Liberty and thinking about multiple registers of immigration and the immigration history of this country and this city and the kind of entry point. Um, so here I'll stop my um, presentation and um, hand it over to Julie herself um, for any questions that might come up. Thank you so much. Is, do you pronounce your name Jean? 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 Yeah. That's close Xing. enough. Sorry Xing. about that. Xing. Is that close? Xing? Did I get it? Or no? Very close. <laughs> Okay, well, thank you so much. Thank you for the time and consideration and thought you put into doing this. I wasn't, I wasn't um, sure that I would be able to make the earlier part of the talk. So I really appreciate you um, walking through the show and giving this, um, sharing, sharing this information. I'm re I, I mean, I think I would just like to say I'm, I'm very um, honored to be here and I would love to open it up for any questions if anyone has any questions and I'm happy to answer any questions that might come up. Julie, I see there are already questions in the Q&A section, so you can click it open and respond to them. Oh, okay. Yeah. So one question says, your work presents layers and, and layers of not just technica tech technicalities, but socioeconomic and architectural features. Have you thought about registering a new layer in a future series of works that talks about the moment we are living right now with the effects of COVID and how you foresee that as a language in your work? Um, I can answer by saying that I um, actually made a, a, a group of paintings during the, during the, the, the first months of the shutdown um, and, uh, and quarantine that we all experienced. And those paintings were shown at Marion Goodman Gallery in November and December of 2020. And um, they weren't actually, they were made during this time and they were very made during, during that form of time, that feeling of suspended time and precarity of that, intense precarity of that time in that situation. But I don't really think of any of these paintings as being kind of descriptions or based, like uh, being based on something, um, you know, like solely in terms of the, the, the information that, that um, 
references or becomes a point of departure in the work or that or or that suggests the context that the work is being made in but rather these paintings are um, the making of, of, of a visual experience that becomes very um, uh, that becomes very um, It kind of it becomes it that visual ex experience becomes and 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 physical visceral experience in front of the work becomes the the, the kind of emergent kind of dialogue that I'm interested in and becomes something else and that 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 evolution or that that emergence of this other thing and this other experience is what I'm more interested in what is possible in the freedom of abstraction and what I mean by freedom I mean the liberatory space of the opacity available in abstraction and the kind of being able to negotiate and play with these ideas of um, the kind of false binary between abstraction and figuration and or, or abstraction and representation let's say and that that represent that, that that there's this false binary that one is either one or the other but i'm much more interested in playing around with the kind of concepts of mythology and archetypes and and what kind of is suggested what are digested ideas of ideology and myth that are embedded in how we make assumptions but they become the kind of they are the fabric of how we how we digest make sense and 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 consume time, place, and who we are. And so for me, a lot of these kind of, how do you find a place of, to, to, to figure that out differently is a lot of the driving questions for me and in terms of how do I do that in painting. So um, I don't know that, for, there's nothing that I can really like foresee, but I think that um, the last works that were in the exhibition actually are responding to this moment. And um, they're not. They're not responding. You know, each the paintings that I make are made in that time, but really about they're made from this place of trying to figure out how to push my work further, what I'm interested in, in the language that's evolving in the work, and then how does that relate to, to what I'm involved in at that time. Um, but another person, Howard Williams, at, who introduced us, asked the question. There's so much content and so many symbols, maps, flags, architectural drawings, and so many fabulous actions. Uh, architectural renderings and photos and manipulated photos in the work. I spotted one pink triangle. Are there any other queer symbols in the works that I didn't recognize? Well, I don't know what you said, what, 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 what becomes, what, what you want to think of as symbols or as forms of language and mark making or body parts or sexual activities that are happening. But there's a lot of, and there's a lot of information in those paintings that people can pick up on and that, um, that are recognizable at times or that feel felt at times. But I think that um, if you look a lot, you'll see a lot of, a lot in the paintings, a lot that, you know, I'll leave you to look for it. <laughs> we have a question in the chat also that's uh, from Eugene that says, hello, Julie, thank you for being here. My husband and I visited your spellbinding exhibit at the Whitney last month and were blown away by the sheer scale of your work. Throughout our experience, I kept asking, how did she do it? There was a video in one of the rooms that provided some peekaboo into the process, like swaths of painting, placement, and removal of tape. But I'm still unclear how you depict the hyper meticulous thin lines of the maps, blueprints, architecture, layer upon layer. How are they made? How do they end up on the piece of art itself? So the, that's a good question. The 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 basically all these architectural renderings, the majority of them, are made from projected photographs that are projected into the painting, photographs of the buildings, and then those photographs are traced by. Uh, earlier they were traced by me years ago in the paintings, and now I work with. Uh, and now now because I'm not doing that kind of painting anymore, but when I was doing that work, I worked with a group of assistants who really knew how to. Um, who who could art who could draw really well? Um, they they ranged from a few that were trained in architecture, but the majority of them were just really great artists. Um, architects aren't really taught to draw by hand that much anymore, and so the, um, the the architects that I did end up working with turns out were trained in like an Eastern European context, which I think is super interesting. That where they still insisted on hand drawing. So that's just an aside about that that type of technology disappearing. But most of the Others are either graffiti artists or other artists I've worked with who are just incredibly deft draftspeople. And they were able to 
take these photographs that I would project and give them some basic instruction on how I wanted it drawn with how much detail, how little, how little detail or what, how much of the, of the rendering I wanted to do. And then carefully that is then the photograph is then rendered um, in perspectively and mathematically to fit into the context of the painting. So they're really talented, amazing hands and, um, and the team that I work with that are able to actually draw those with rapidograph pens right onto the surface of the paint. Yeah, I, I love the inclusion of that um, video and that piece because I'm, I'm much of a process person as well. And so I love the detail about yeah the music that was involved or just getting a sense of what the studio environment is like was definitely something that I was thinking of while I was walking through the show and saying to myself, like, I wonder what the energy was like in the studio while these pieces are being made. Um, but I, I don't want to take up too much time from the other questions, but Pablo asks, hi, Julie, thank you for sharing your words with us. My question is, are there any artists that inspired your geometric play that you enjoy looking back to for inspiration? Well, uh, like, okay, so geometric abstraction is something I've been looking at for a very long time. And you'll find that in early Ethiopian um, uh, Coptic manuscripts, um, a lot of the kind of, uh, decorative elements or, um, or, or the structure of the way that these manuscripts are put together works with this kind of early geometric geometry, geometric patterning and structuring. Um, but you'll also see that in a lot of really early and prehistoric forms of architecture, for whether you're thinking about structures in Babylonian or Egyptian or um, in, uh, in Ethiopia, such as structures like Lalibela, or you're looking in um, South America in terms of different forms of Aztec or Mayan structures all, all through the continent of South America, you'll find these kind of really amazingly complex uh, and beautifully or simplified in, at times um, geometric kind of structuring and, and, and thinking around the universe and around being and around possibilities and, and how all of this can be articulated in this very geometric structure. And I think a bit, but I go, so I'm saying I go back that far, but I can, I also look at like the early, the like early S, uh, efforts in suprematist, in suprematist work and the futurists and the kind of rise of how different forms of technology and the and and film and you know the the how the world was changing and how d these kind of social desires were embedded in some of this geometric abstract. Um, it was interesting that Xing included the um, the Guy Debord map, the Situationist from the Situationist International, and that the map that. Um, that was was put was was put in this context of like this of of the of the drift and kind of getting lost in Paris. The, all of that work. I mean, I was looking at those art, and they were they, that was also important to me. As of course were other forms of geometric abstraction that emerged here in this country and that have a very different kind of source. Whether it's um, coming from like. Uh, for structures such as Kandinsky, but also from this country, really kind of basic things going all the way through the minim minimalist projects and the kind of effort um, of, of, the, of creating these kind of monuments and what could happen by, by, by juxtaposing particular kinds of signs through that form of minimalism. So all of that has been, has been inform informative to me. Um, I think really differently about it now, but I look at work, all kinds of work constantly and think about it's relation to the to the bigger aspect of making art. Thank you for, for sharing that. Um, there's a two part question from Kiko, I think ties in nicely to what you just said, because, you know, the content of what's in these paintings can be heavy at times when when you when you think about them, or you sit with them for a while. And Kiko asks, um, do you have a spiritual practice? And how does it inform process and visual work? Or do you consider your artistic process a spiritual practice? That's one part. Second part is, how do you see or do you see your process in, and work in that larger context of the quote unquote collective in the Jungian sense that we are all contributing to and siphoning from? That's a great question. Okay, so I think like, I. 
I feel that my engagement in the world and my engagement in myself and my and trying to make sense of the world and myself and the the larger dynamics at play are all part of and 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 in that it's painting and making is a huge part of that is all part of this kind of if you want to call it a spiritual practice or an engaged practice a a, a, a way of being it is it is it is kind of inherent to the way that i live and engage in the world and and love and take care of my family and nurture and 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 take try to take care of my community and the and pay attention and 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 love all that is around me so in that i i try to really like that that that's a core part of the way that I engage and exist in the world, and and I and I don't know that I would consider that a spiritual practice, but it's a way of being. And so for me, the painting is a part of that. It, it is intrinsically a part of that, and it's the one way that I think and try to imagine, um, and and try to make sense of things. But also, I love this quote. I don't won't get it completely correct. Um, but a quote by Jack Whitten who says he, wa he wants to make, he wants to be able to live in the world. He wants to live the what he wants to live the way his paintings teach him to, or something along those lines, live like his paintings or some, so his, the paintings can kind of be these, these instructors. And there's something very interesting about that idea, which I think is um, about what can, what can be possible and what can be, what can be invented in, in these spaces. And when, 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 when the imagination can be um, kind of, when when you when you can access the imagination and when you talk about the collective, going back to that that Jungian sense of the collective and the kind of larger connectivity between all of us, I you know I thought I think about this a lot and I've spoken um, several times about intuition and the space of making from you from into from into from an intuitive place is almost being this way of accessing this kind of ontological congregation of resistance, this kind of ontological space of the ancestral, the kind of whole, the communal, the kind of larger networks that were embedded in us, that are imprinted in us, that are, that are, that, that are the archetypes that inform us and that are the kind of various ideologies and mythologies and temporalities that kind of engage who we are. And, um, and, and a lot of the kind of oppressive, um, oppressive forms of, of, of thinking and making that have informed who and what we can be and how we can be in that. And the resistance to that, that kind of a radical kind of imag uh, emancipatory um, imaginary resistance, like imaginary force that could, uh, to think of as resistance. And so for me, all of that is, a, is part of this practice and way of being and making. I don't know if that was a kind of long-winded kind of answer got unthreaded at the end, but you know, I think hopefully it made some sense. It, it made perfect sense to me. Um, <laughs> I, I know I don't want to take up too much of your time, but um, there are a couple of questions. Do you have time for one more question? Sure, I can take the last couple questions that are here and then we're, yeah, for sure. Okay, maybe we can like go speed round, lightning round through these, these first two of, do you still layer with mylar, drawing, painting, et cetera? Um, no, I work with, more now. I work on paper directly, and um, the the material that I work on really depends on how opaque, how transparent I want the paint to be, how um, how how absorbent. So the surfaces in the exhibition vary. They started from an effort to try and make something that felt very much like mylar, um, but the mylar drawings are very different, and you can tell when you see the show the, what the difference is between the mylar drawings and the paintings, where they're layered with acrylic paint, and that acrylic paint is it was created created at first to simulate to be similar to Mylar or to or to or to simulate that. Uh, what do you think of NFTs and will you venture into this direction? Well right now I think NFTs are one of the biggest gangster moves in the art world. Um, I think that like it's 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 a very different um, form of, of 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 understanding something and I think that um, digital artists and artists that work in, in, within digital media are very different. Um, it's a very different kind of work to uh, to um, an artist like me who's actually working on a physical object. Um, as an artist, in terms of copyright issues or in terms of like intellectual property, an artist retains the copyright of their work. No one else can really 
I, get, I don't think make an NFT unless they will come up to a copyright suit on that. But I think, the, and I think that's an interesting kind of weird space there about the reproduct, reproduction of that work. I think, I, I'm not sure where it's gonna go with NFTs, but I do think that there is a, a place there for, um, uh, for ensuring the, the kind of transparency of, of transactions. And I think that's something that the art world is a, has, has always, had a very complicated time with. It's also the reason it's been such a, it's a complicated world to engage in. It is a, it, 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 it's something that has to really be kind of negotiated differently. And part of that is because these are objects that can be hidden, that can be rolled up, that can be put away, that can be snuck between, you know, that you can take between borders and that you can avoid paying taxes on, that there are all kinds of things that happen in the economy of the art world that are just as shady and gangster as like the NFT market and what happens there. So that's a complicated whole other can of worms. And I, I'm not so interested in that stuff. I'm much more interested outside of just the machinations of that I'm much more interested in the physical visceral experience that can happen in front of a work of art and I think that so a lot of the digital works that are being um, sold or the idea that digital things can then be reproduced those become something very something else and what happens in terms of fair use and what happens in terms of this other place of of, of copying of, of, of creating kind of something unique out of this, out of this, out of, out of, out of absolute, like in some ways nothing, but in other times, incredible amount of work, you know, seven or eight years of a drawing every single day is an, is an immense amount of work and something that, you know, as much as you, uh, you one might like or dislike the content is co something that's impressive. It's not someone just anyone can do. So that's um, something, but I'm not so one sure. Yeah, thank you for that. And I have thoughts on that, which is a whole separate panel. But um, we have a final question from Warren, which I think is timely because it's coming up soon, actually. But um, Warren asks, uh, going back to inspirations, can you speak about the influence of David Hammonds on your work? You've often acknowledged how important his work is to you. Is there an example of Hammonds aesthetic or practice in one of your own specific works, which also leads to the upcoming opening of the David Hammonds piece coming up soon. So if you guys don't know about it, check it out on the Whitney's website, Days Ends, opening up soon to the public. So, but can you speak a little bit about his influence on your work? Yeah, so that piece is the piece that's, op that's open. I mean, you can, it's opening soon, but it's actually finished, I think, right? Almost finished. It, I mean, you can walk by it and you could have watched it in all its stages of construction. Um, and it's an amazing piece on the on the on the water, which is um, the outline, like a line drawing, um, of the uh, Gordometta Clark um, pier that he, I forgot the number of the pier that he um, created that piece. This this kind of intervention in the space called Day's End, and um, this is the out. This is the wireframe drawing of that actual structure, um, but without the actual artwork involved or without any kind of reference to the artwork other than the title of the piece. Um, what, what, I'll, what I'll talk about with David Hammonds that I have found really amazing and, um, and inspiring, but also instructive is how, how, how deeply and ardently and seriously he looks and studies art and understands the kind of, the kind of, um, the kind of, effort at, at what was what was taking place in, within the practice of art, but what also was taking place in the effort to try to subvert um, many kind of uh, assumptions that were made by what art should be, what art could be, who art served, what art, how, how um, modernisms, a lot of the particular tropes of modernism, he was able to actually um, understand in, in detail and in, and in, and in the full kind of range of it, but, but also was able to kind of pierce it in, and, and expose its failures and expose its, its assumptions and expose its fundamental kind of Eurocentricism in, in, its, in, in, its, in, its, in, its, in its sense of um, one of the biggest efforts of modernism was to, to, was to take the kind of European colonial um, modes of, of, of the larger project of, 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 of of the larger modern project, which was to compartmentalize and kind of break everything down into these elemental pieces. 
to this idea of the of the of the objecthood of something on its own without the kind of importance of that maker or with that, not even just necessarily that maker as 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 any form of genius of making some some kind of other aspect of particularly eurocentric very particularly western idea on creative process on thinking around making on what is possible and the idea of making from resistance the idea of making out of the, the capability of making from nothing but the capability of eradication of who one is and the capability of with it which is the basically the history of blackness in this country and the capability and and if you think about blackness as a kind of global condition the capability of kind of the constant invention and the and the and the insistence on that not just now as a reaction but as a constant being is a constant history of, of invention and, and, and existence. I think what's interesting about what Hammond throws into the into this is a constant co conversation with his peers, with earlier aspects of modernity. And there's a constant um, uh, kind of really brilliant use of that same language with the subversion, with a way to expose its failures and its assumptions and throw a, throw turn that the, that assumption of being able to empty something out to make it just about itself and referential to itself show how impossible that is and that that in itself itself is a form of like fundamental um, supremacy and so I think that's a really um, really amazing part of his work and for me one of um, there's a piece that I that I actually live with uh, a body print of David Hammonds where he um, has created this kind of his fingers and his face and his chest are in the in the image but his mouth becomes you think it's just this mouth that's kind of up against this this in the and the facial hair but his mouth is right pressed against the image and the kind of idea and cowrie shells almost of an eye and the face turns into puzzles as do the fingers but what's amazing when you look at this print over time is that the, the mouth is the third eye and the third eye, like it becomes this other, it, ha, it contains this other presence, which is the opposite of what anything that was trying to be made during that time did. Like it was, the, it, 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 is, it, is, it is showing how kind of, in, like it is about in a way there's a form, even if it's in the most minimal structure like the creation of this peer, there's a re-enchantment in that work and a, and, a, and a connectedness to that possibility that is fundamental to something deeply human and deeply inventive and deeply resistant, constantly resistant and resilient. Thank you. Thank you so much for, for sharing that. And I, I look forward to seeing your show again, as well as um, seeing Thank the you. completed David Hammond's um, piece. I know I was able to see it from the fifth floor window right across from your work. So, you know, there's definitely something between your both of your work that also pays homage to, you know, I know with this piece, there's there's a part of it that pays homage to Gordon Mata Clark and and that whole experience in your work that pays homage to some of these experiences that have happened, um, you know, in the past. So thank you, Julie, for joining us. Thank Any you, parting words you. for you. emerging artists that are in the room? Look at the, everything that you can. Go see everything. Thing that's being made. Don't count on Instagram as your negotiator for what it, what is being made and how you're part of co um, contemporary culture. And and not to say, not to take anything away from that platform, but that seeing things in real life changes how and where and how you can think about making and what you're engaged with. But also look at everything historically. And I, that's I think that's an incredible, um, amazing thing. There's amazing shows up right now. Go see those and be a part of that conversation. Thank you. There you go. Thank you so much, Julie. And I look <laughs> forward you, to seeing you. you in person sometime soon. So, and everyone stays as queer as possible. Yes, always. <laughs> Take care. Have a good night, <laughs> thank everyone. You. Thank you so much.